Welcome to Mostly Minutia. I'm Colleen Lindell. This is episode 29, Griefing, with Jean Villapique. Jean Villapique is an actor, writer, and improviser. She's had recurring roles in shows such as 30 Rock, Up All Night, The Office, Baskets, and HBO's Sharp Objects. She currently stars in NBC's new comedy, AP Bio. In August of 2016, Jean started a WordPress blog called Griefing. And for the record, I strongly dislike even attaching the word blog to what Jean has created because her writings are so beautiful and intricate. And in my personal opinion, these are more of what I consider to be peerings, like appearing into Jean's soul or giftings perhaps, because she opens up these very private moments and then gifts them over to you. And what she has actually created is a series of very raw but extremely funny essays surrounding grief, and specifically her grief. A very honest and humorous look into a few years of extremely difficult and considerable loss. Several miscarriages, rounds of IVF, and the passing of her father. Just a note, a key player in this episode, and someone who comes up in our conversation a lot, is Jean's husband, Brian Finkelstein. Brian is also a writer and performer and plays a vibrant and positive role in Jean's life. And lastly, a little frame of reference, Jean and I met on the set of Up All Night, in which she played a character named Terry, married to a character coincidentally named Jean, who was played by the talented Matt Bronger. The show starred Christina Applegate, Will Arnett, and Maya Rudolph. And in the show, Christina and Will's characters are married, and Jean and Matt play their nerdy, goody-two-shoe next-door neighbors. We'll start off this episode talking a bit about Jean's career for about, oh, say, 13 minutes, and then we'll begin our transition into griefing. At the end of 2016, I started thinking about what I wanted 2017 to look like as far as for this podcast Mm -hmm. Uh, but one thing that I noticed in like my lineup of my dream interviews for 2017 is that each person was who I consider to be a door opener like people who allow others to shine before they themselves are like I need to shine and I think that you do that thank you (laughs) that's a really really nice compliment thank you very much so you and I met on the set of up all night Mm -hmm. I will say specifically that I did notice that you would do that with your character. <laughs> I was open with my character, you mean, or like... Yeah, yeah. Oh, you, I, I guess. Well, your character was named Terry. Mm-hmm. You were playing the wife of a guy named Gene. Well, so the show starred Will Arnett, Christina Applegate, Maya Rudolph, and the joke between the three of them is that they could never tell. You were the, you guys were the, their neighbors. They could never tell which was Gene and which was Terry. But it's yeah. also funny that your name is Jean. Yeah. <laughs> it's just another layer of, <laughs> and we're also both nerds, Matt Bronger and I. <laughs> but you guys were always were really good at playing off of each other, I thought. And speaking on behalf of the camera department, we always enjoyed your guys' scenes. Because oh, we, w- we would read the scripts ahead of time. And if we saw, oh, Jean and Terry are here. Oh, we love when Jean and Terry are oh, here. Oh, thanks. Well, they wrote such great, Emily, I mean, Emily Spivey, who created the show, wrote such funny stuff for us. Like really just such specific weirdness mm-hmm. to those two characters that was made it really easy. And I also knew Matt Bronger so when we were auditioning for that, I was like, oh, hey, how nice. Like to s- some people, when you see them at auditions, it's like, hello, ice competition weirdness. But some people you're just like, oh, I mean, not that I would ever be competing with Matt Bronger. We're very different. But um, <laughs> um, some people just kind of light you up when you see them. And he's just such a wonderful, kind, funny guy that and it was all it was supposed to be that one episode, too. So we were just like, really That's fun. Yeah, it was like a one day co-star thing or something or one day guest star. Like, yeah. And they wrote more scenes for you yeah. guys. Where, did you guys have a scene where you were playing keyboard? You guys had like a band. You guys had a child. We did. And I still see that. I sometimes see that kid at auditions, <laughs> which is weird. <laughs> Does he remember you? <laughs> yeah. And I remember his parents too. Like his mom would be like, oh, say hi. I'm like, oh, hi. Or sometimes I'm in just a shit mood. And I'm just like, oh, I need to be nice because you're a child. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> hello. Because <laughs> especially commercial auditions are just... Uh, 
it's just like cattle. You're just like in these very, and like every woman is in with their like fucking really expensive handbag. Like, you look great. You look great. Did you lose weight? And she's like, oh, please let me get out of here. That's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm I'm gathering from other actor friends of mine. Actually, most of my friends these days are actors. It's really weird. My life has been totally flipping as far as um, who I keep as close company has changed to actors and writers. (laughs) I like actors and writers. (laughs) Me too. Me too. I love them. And I, I really love that right now, especially on set that it's, it's like a writer's paradise. I love that they have such a great presence on set and their voices are being heard. It makes me so happy. I try to tell the writers, like if we get the scripts ahead of time, I try to tell them, I really like this line. This is so funny. And they're always like, oh, yeah, so-and-so wrote that. That is really good. Uh, <laughs> it's really, my husband is a writer, and to the, for the writers I know as well, like, it's just so grueling to put yourself out there like that, and mm-hmm. especially trying to be funny and write and continuing to generate material like that is a really tough exercise. So I think it's really helpful to go say like this line really makes me laugh at any level it's so nice for people to hear like that's really great or funny I think sometimes when people get successful other people are like well you don't need compliments anymore (laughs) Mm, encouragement yeah they're like you have all the encouragement you need yeah you got this job yeah (laughs) (laughs) well I noticed on up all night that um maybe tell me if this happens to you in your life that you just attract people to you like you create (laughs) You, you bring such a know. warm presence with you, Thank you that when you guys were on set with us, you were just part of the family right away. It felt like, yeah, of course, Jean's supposed to be on set with us. Aww. It's weird when she's not here. And and Matt also has a very warm presence. I mean, you guys were, mm-hmm. both felt very approachable. But yeah, I that's what I've noticed you carry, like, a, like you bring your own light. Oh, my gosh. You. Thanks. <laughs> Wow. Well, that makes me think that <clears throat> having come up in Chicago, the second, especially the Second City and Improv Olympic uh, actors I know, um, are very respectful of everyone. Like when you work at Second City, the entire staff. It's not just like we're the actors and everybody else shows up for. Uh, it, it, there's a, a very strong sense of community with the people in the box office and the wait staff and everybody. And I think that it gets passed along. Like my very first job, and this was extraordinarily lucky, was to be on 30 Rock. And Jack McBrayer, who was, um, when he left, I took his role. And so when I showed up, he was like, introduced me around to everybody. And everyone I knew was like, "Um, who wrote your episode? Who's the director? Who are, you know, to make sure like, you don't just show up and be like, I'm a star. Bye. You know, like to really take into consideration everyone who's there and remember everyone's name and all that stuff and Hmm. ask questions instead of just show up. And so I think being in a community of people who are that um, not so narcissistic or whatever Mm -hmm. helped me to approach jobs. Because I I, sometimes when actors do that, I think it's just insecurity of just like, I don't know who to talk to. And the first three jobs I had to, I'm like, I'm not going to go talk to a professional camera person because I don't know what to say. And I look like an idiot, you know? So instead of just saying like, what's the frame? Like, that's something you said to me that I was like, Oh, I I never took a class and knew to ask what my frame was or this or that. So Hmm. I don't know. And I just went to a little, no, that's so good. I, I always think, um, so I really like actors. I'm like a big fan of them as like a, I always tell my, my roommate, this is like a people group. Um, like a tribe of humans. Um, yeah, because <laughs> I feel like, so you might have a manager or an agent, but you consistently, you have to show up to set on your own. I show up to set with a whole camera department. I mean, the other actors are, are going to be there that you get to rehearse with or play off of, but largely you, you're there on your own behalf. And then not only that, you guys have to consistently make risky emotional choices to let your heart be open to whatever the character is experiencing and then be willing to go into that role in front of all these people. Oh my God, it's, what are we doing? (laughs) I have to rethink it. It's humiliating. (laughs) I I just have great respect. Um, I will say that because I started in scripted in Chicago and I mean scripted movies. Um, Since I've moved here, I've been working mostly with people who've been trained in improvisation. And um, I notice a total night and day difference as far as uh, 
etiquette on set and how I'm treated as a crew member is so kind, so much kindness from the improvisers. And then not only that, they're just, you guys are all so fabulously talented. You're such good actors. Were you classically trained? Yes. (laughs) You were? Because I was wondering about that. If you had started from, you know, improv or if improv found you or, you know, if you were trained in theater first or how did that work out? Well, um, I went to Northwestern and uh, I went to study theater, theater. And I did, I was, I'm from a very small town and I was like, hello, Dolly. I was Dolly Gallagher. Actually, some, we shared the role. I don't mean to be like obnoxious, but we like, so it was like, ooh, musicals. This is what I do. And I'm going to go to college and do musicals. Or we did, actually, my, my drama teacher in high school was so awesome. We did a, a Lorca play, Federico Garcia Lorca, called Blood Wedding, which is just like a very beautiful and heavy play for high school. It's like Spanish grief, and it was awesome. And so I got to college and just auditioned for everything I could, and I didn't even know what improv was because it was like 1991. So I had seen New Student Week. They had like a little improv show for the new students, and I was like, what is this? It's it's so fun. It was like short-form games. So I auditioned for that, and I remember the audition very clearly. I just, they were like, this is the conceit of the game, and you do this, and I really just instinctually got it. And the woman who directed that show and cast me is still a great friend of mine, and I was like, oh, this is, it's like I was a fish on land all of a sudden. I was like, oh, this is, I swim. Okay, that's how, it was like meant for me, so. And I did take, you know, Shakespeare and all that stuff in college as well, but I lost interest in it because and I did a couple of plays after college too and I guess I remember listening to some actors and if, if their line was like a bowl of pecans every night would be like a bowl of pecans a, it was like a record and I was like can't you change it a little like it doesn't have to be totally different every night but I could tell that they were mechanically repeating and I was like this is awful to spend my time this way to stand and hear this record and then just chime in, you know, so improv to me was so much more exciting and mm-hmm. creative and you could be a writer and um, yeah, so mm-hmm. I just kept doing that. Mm-hmm. Are there certain games that you prefer over other ones, like that you naturally gravitate towards in improv? Well, um, I do. I love short form games and I, but I mostly have done long form shows where you take a suggestion and you do like a half hour piece with your ensemble or um, uh, the famous Harold um, uh, Del Close's um, long form. But uh, I, I guess I, I haven't had the occasion to do short form in a long time and I do miss it. Like when I toured for a second city, we would at the end of the show have an, an improv set and we would play those games. And I love even like freeze tag or I like to be able to make quick, big, fun choices or there's one called Oscar winning moment. So it'll be like, you guys are having coffee and all of a sudden like, here's Colleen's Oscar winning moment. And you can be like, God damn it. You would just take whatever is happening and blow it, like blow it out to the extreme. And I think it's because in my life, I'm a very uh, reserved person. So it's very fun to be just like, just let you, my freak flag fly that way. Just like act crazy and then be like, okay, that's over. Back mm-hmm. to being an unassuming <laughs> human. <laughs> anyway. Do you feel like you are unassuming? Like when you go into places, do you think that people... Have- I think <laughs> I think I don't have a good perspective on what I'm like, to be honest. I think that I would sell myself short and be like, uh, nobody probably remembers me or blah, 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 blah. And I'm sure I'm just like an you know, average person. I'm sure I'm just fine. I just try not to take up too much space and you know what I mean? In the way that you can when you're improvising, I guess is how I'd say like in my life, I try to like not take up so much space. Okay. When you were in high school, did you discover drama in high school? Yeah, we had this great teacher in a very small town. Her name's uh, Dolores Delasanti. My my high school was a public school and it was for like three or four towns and there were 120 people in my graduating class. So it was like very sparsely populated. So we amazingly had a great art teacher, Mr. Wilson, and we had um, Del, Dolores Del Sante, who was our acting teacher. And she had us doing these like sun salutation warm ups and Grotowski and talk, taught us about Lorca. And we did Commedia dell'arte my senior year, like stuff that when I got to college, I was like, oh, I know what all of this is instead of like, we're doing Greece and we're doing this, which is also fine. But so in high school, I a group of us really loved it. And we were called like the acting troupe. It wasn't even just acting class. We had this troupe and then we would mm-hmm. go perform these little comedia shows and stuff. It was really fun. 
Do you still talk to her? I do. I saw her when my dad died last year. She lives, I mean, like 10 minutes away from where he lived. Mm. And she came over when he was dying. And it was so nice because Mm. I hadn't seen her. When my parents got divorced, my mom kind of stayed more in touch with her than my dad did. Um, So like a couple of times at Christmas, we would go over and have like cookies. And she's now like probably in her late 60s. But she's kind of in like an old-fashioned lady and just have like tea and little Christmas cookies and like Italian cookies. And, Mm -hmm. but I hadn't seen her much through the years, but she was just like, hi, I'm here and I'm going to sit here and bring some flowers and sit in the house. Like, I didn't know that's what you do when someone's dying, but it's really cool when people just kind of show up and like, just Mm -hmm. be present, Mm -hmm. not even to talk or anything. And you're not just experiencing alone, just to have Mm -hmm. a shared experience is helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and, And they're not expecting you to entertain them in some way they're just there to just be with you yeah mm-hmm. so you started a blog in 2016 august of 2016 mm-hmm. it is um very a very raw blog about your life and i love it because you've like created this way of expressing um mm-hmm. and sharing yourself with other people and like letting people into these very private places that one couldn't share if they decided not to. But well, first of all, so your your blog is called Griefing. Wait, it's called Griefing, not the video game. Oh yeah, griefing. <laughs> not the video game kind. Yeah, or just Griefing. Yeah, is what it's called. But I guess I, I had to put that parenthetical in there because when I googled the word when I was trying to, I guess that word had just been in my mind because I had had so much grief for so long and talking about grief with my therapist and grief, grief, like I was just sick of the word. Mm -hmm. And then it was kind of a funny way to be like, just griefing around. I'm just griefing again. You know, um, it's an action you take against someone else in a video game, like to hurt them or undermine them or something. Yeah. Well, it's funny because also in improv, I mean, you work with an ensemble of people sometimes and that you could be griefing your your teammates. (laughs) And how would that be like undermining them, like making fun of them and like undermining them in some way in well, a show or wouldn't it be not going with their yes and oh yeah you're right mm-hmm. or going with their yes and but then but then stealing the thunder by also showing off yourself yeah in some sort I love of it yeah I mean I don't love it I think it's terrible <laughs> <laughs> but I like that that was something you I articulated thought of. that perfectly yeah improv griefing I yeah I was wondering if you could talk about what made you want to start your blog because it's like your your life, it seems like you live in this place of such comedy and humor around you. And, and also your blog is so funny. Each entry is so funny and then filled with the exact opposite end of that, which is like deep sorrow. Yeah. What made you want to start your blog? Well, I felt like, so there was a progression of things that happened. I got married Brian and I got married in 2012. I was 39 and we wanted to have kids. So we got married in August. I think I got pregnant in January or February and had a miscarriage at 12 weeks, which was devastating. It was the first time in my life I had been pregnant. My sister is three years older than I am and had a baby at 40. So I was like, we're related. This will be fine. And, um, And then I got pregnant again in October and lost, I had a miscarriage at 11 weeks. And it's very different to have a miscarriage at like eight weeks, then 12 weeks. And I know there are stories of many weeks miscarriage or stillbirth. It just gets worse and worse, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, But I kept, I was so determined that we were going to have a family. Uh, We kept trying. And then I had a third miscarriage. And by then, the third time I was pregnant that March after the October one, I was like, three's a charm. I kept thinking like, well, the third one. And then I lost that as well. And then I just stopped telling people or people were like, you should probably not try anymore. But I really thought, I really felt in a strong way that it was going to happen mm-hmm. and had two more miscarriages. So fi- by the time it was five, I was like, oh, I- it had been t- two years of real big losses hmm. and a lot of privacy around it because I didn't want to tell people what was going on. Mm-hmm. And I didn't tell people I was pregnant necessarily. And there were different ideas about like, wait until 12 weeks to tell people. I mean, the first time we had a dinner and like, New York and told our whole family, like 20 people like, hey, there's a baby. And I flew home and had a miscarriage at four in the morning. It was just Mm -hmm. like, oh, I I wish we didn't tell, you know. So, but if you don't tell anybody, which I did down the road, then 
nobody helps you out. Then you are just bearing this. Like Brian and I were just silently like, this happened. Mm-hmm. Let's not go to dinner with anyone because it's. I, I just was so sad. Anyway, it just became too much to bear. Then we tried IVF three times. or The first time didn't work. The second time. And then in between the second and third time, my dad got sick and died so quickly mm-hmm. out of the blue, like perfectly healthy. And then he had bile duct cancer and just died. And, and then returning from that and trying the last round of IVF and that not working and mm-hmm. just being like, I just don't know what to do anymore. Like I had all of this, I just didn't know what to do with all of these sad stories. And I just felt like since I hadn't shared a lot of them and there was so much, I was like, there's got to be a way to get this out. And it also in a way helped me just tell people I love what happened so I wouldn't have to tell it Mm -hmm. 15 times to like my aunt, my mom, my sister, my best friends here, my best friends in New York, like here, just, this is, it's just easier. Mm -hmm. I love the titles of your entries. And I like that some of the entries are different angles of view from the same time period. It's amazing how much you see. How long does it take you to write an entry? Some that are more sensitive, I've done like 10 drafts of. And the first drafts are usually dismal, like my dad died, like just just not funny. But I've found that it's helpful just to write the worst, the the least kind of polished version of it to get everything out. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I will write them three times from scratch. And then if something keeps surfacing, like, oh, that for whatever reason, that pick line in his arm keeps coming up, then I'll realize that's important. Brian has helped me so much too, because he teaches a lot. He's a writer. He's like, he knows how to craft stories so beautifully and does them for the moth and is so talented that he's like, usually the first two paragraphs, the first quarter of what you're saying isn't necessary that I'm like so the sun was coming up and this and then I finally get to like um nobody ate breakfast that day or what Mm. that's not something happened but like if you just start at that interesting point and go from Mm -hmm. there it's fine another thing I'll say about this whole blog is that anytime I looked for miscarriage support groups or something to read it was like miscarriage is a loss of a a baby's life that you need to mourn and grieve. And I was just like, ugh. Like it was all very heavy and precious. And I was like, this is also, it's it's very sad, but some parts of it are ridiculous. And some parts of it, it doesn't need to be, I don't think that sad things need to be treated with such reverence. I Hmm. think it makes it harder. It's not, it doesn't honor the truth of what happens because life like death, it's all just messy and weird and sometimes funny at the same time. So I wanted to create a, a conversation about this kind of stuff that, mm-hmm. that had a sense of humor to it or that wasn't just like, I don't know. Are people confiding in you? Like, do you find that this has opened up, like people are seeking you out to talk with you about things? Yeah, people have sent me private messages a lot. I mean, I do post it on Facebook and yeah, some people have shared it with other people and some people have, I mean, a lot of people are losing their parents that I know right now too. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had a lot of responses in a lot of ways and mm-hmm. It's been helpful in that way for me too. Just to know that, wow, a ton of other people were going through IVF than I knew at the same time or something or hmm. had dealt with hoarding with one of their parents or something like that. That it's just like, at some point, it's, it, yeah, it's definitely helpful. Mm-hmm. Something I, I really like is that you consistently refer to Mariska Hargitay. You refer to SVU as like a safe place for you to be experiencing Olivia Benson solving things. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of people can relate to that because let's face it, if you're watching SVU, you are watching it for Mariska Hargitay. Totally. Totally. I mean, maybe Christopher Maloney in the first few seasons, but that's over. (laughs) Now it's all Mariska. Yeah. He's a loose cannon. He's a hothead. She's got the perfect balance of strength and compassion. Like Mm -hmm. she's so strong and so vulnerable at the same time. And just watching her like, not anymore, buddy, just like watching her just bust perps, bust perps. And a couple of my Chicago friends, different ones are like, I have a justice issue where they're like, you know, pick up your dog shit or whatever, like Mm -hmm. justice, like just wanting this. And it is fun to just watch or it's a relief to just watch justice being served. You know, even if it's all fiction, it just is helpful to play that out Mm -hmm. when things just feel like when you feel helpless. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that um, part of the reason I wrote this too is that when my dad died, 
my sister couldn't be there. So mm-hmm. I was alone in his house with his girlfriend who I don't have a close relationship with. Mm-hmm. So all the stuff that was happening, I didn't have anyone to relate to. And Brian was there some and had to go and come back. So I was like, oh, this is my way of, because I, I think I also felt like I'm holding all of this in and I need to relate and there's not a place to relate. So I think that's mm. probably why I felt compelled to write, to try to relate to people. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like in writing this that it has been healing for you in any way? Yeah, it kind of puts some things to rest. Like when I was haunted, I think I wrote about dreaming about dreaming about my father and that helped just to just put it out there instead of holding on to it is, has been very helpful for me to let go. Like I felt like, did you ever see the movie The Mission with Jeremy Irons? It's from the 80s yes. and Robert De Niro is like climbing up with yes. all, I mean, it's like a, a penance he's paying. But I felt like I was carrying around all of these, this sadness and that I'm mm-hmm. kind of like shedding it a little bit as I write about it. Like mm-hmm. not that it didn't happen, but that I'm processing it, I guess. Mm-hmm. But I also don't want it to be this thing where I'm like, you guys, I'm processing my miscarriage grief, you know, because that's self-indulgent and gross so and that's why brian has also been so helpful like not only was he helpful in saying like get to it faster but he was like i think you can make it funnier and it's okay and initially mm-hmm. i was like but i'm not going to joke about death and you know like i took it very seriously and then i was like oh no that is so helpful and immediately what everyone responded to was like this is funny mm-hmm. so i have to give him all the credit for that it's mm-hmm. so he really shined a light on that mm-hmm. uh jean would you read for us ivfing Colleen, yes, I would. I.V. Effing. Last week, my husband and I drove to the valley to find an adoption seminar that friends recommended. It was at some hotel, and we weren't sure we were at the right place until he said, Here it is. Here come the saddies. To be fair, there were some very happy gay couples and some straight couples with a little bounce in their step registering, but most people giving their names and receiving information folders and waters had the sighing look of, We are almost out of hope, and if this doesn't work, I don't know, maybe several pets? It felt similar to an IVF seminar we had gone to just a year ago. We drove separately that time, and I got there first. I was greeted in the lobby by a middle-aged woman wearing very determined pumps and a lot of lipstick, who said, Well, hello, how are you? Can I get your name, please? Wow, would you please spell that? Ah, thank you. There you are. How interesting. What does that mean? Oh, and what sort of work do you do? Ah, what a creative profession. These free seminars include free food. The adoption one had a huge pink box of donuts, which was great, but IVF was a real spread. Cheese plate, caprese salad on a stick, miniature sandwiches. I took everything. I don't mess around with free food. We sat in an overfurnished room with five white middle-aged doctors introducing themselves in front of a giant alarming tropical fish tank. The trapped fish swam slowly back and forth while the doctors took turns congratulating the young egg freezers on their wisdom, telling inspiring stories of babies born to almost elderly mothers, and finally walking us through the shitty truth, charts and statistics that went either way up, not good, or way down also not good when the age was around mine, not 35. I felt competitive about it and hopeful. We could still do it. I'm young for my age. I'm a free spirit. I still don't color my hair. Something, something was the key to why this would work. We signed up. Two weeks later, I came back for my first visit. The medical lobby had three, no kidding, chandeliers and a cappuccino machine that made a Keurig look like camping equipment. It was so confusing. Gold white marble was the palette. The music in the background was Sean Colvin. I felt angry about the wasted money while simultaneously deeply comforted by memories of college roommates. It was like they asked an interior designer, can you soothe specifically desperate women aged 37 to 45? And that designer said, oh my, yes I can. They called my name and I went back for my first of many vaginal ultrasounds. Now, I know lots of bulletproof women. I see women all the time in Los Angeles talking about things that are very vulnerable or private and a loud, flat tone with a hard sense of humor. I imagine these women could get ultrasounds every day, could make sales calls while getting an ultrasound shake a martini. I lean more towards saying, (laughs) at least buy me dinner first, but I've already experienced people in the medical profession not enjoying that sort of nervous comedy. So instead, I just tried to carry on a limp conversation about the Emmys. And when my voice caught, I pretended I was clearing my throat. So your first IVF ultrasound, it begins. 
What happens during this is they count how many egg follicles you have. There's a different number every cycle, so if you're lucky, you get a nice high number, and then you take home the drugs to make them all develop instead of nature's usual choice, one. The drugs are terrible. If you asked me a year ago, I would have cocked my head and said, it's actually not that bad. Um, it is that bad. You stick shots into your stomach in the morning and at night. You have to mix them up and watch complicated videos and time them right. And if you fuck it up, it costs thousands of dollars. Even that part is scary. And you go back for another ultrasound two days later and they draw some blood, more needles. Everything is fine. Means to an end. You want a cappuccino from that machine, but no caffeine for you. And good. Eight eggs are growing. Good. But even if it wasn't too bad to deliver shots around your navel on day one, guess what? Five days later, your skin is sensitive. Your brain is sensitive. You are swelling up a little, so you look a little poochy. And then the needle hurts, really hurts. But you're halfway now, so you don't stop because you're not a quitter, because it's so much money, because nobody stops in the middle. And then you go on the ninth day and you are full on sentimental now. And the indigo girls are playing. Ah, and there's a different lady who draws your blood and she speaks with an accent and says she had a hard night the last night that she and her husband both work, but she cleans and she makes the home and the dinner. And she says, women says it harder than men's. And you well up and start to cry for all women and go wait 20 minutes with your pants down and your phone in your hand for your ultrasound because they are really busy today. You take a picture of the ultrasound machine. A gorgeous 5'10 nurse practitioner named Kitty, this is true, comes in and says, we're really busy today. And you say, because of the full moon? And she coldly cocks her head, which can't be. It can't be that someone who works with women's cycles hasn't noticed the effect of the full moon, right? But you ask instead about the street fair and things look good and the retrieval day is set. So you take a special trigger shot when you get home the next night. It triggers the ovulation at exactly the right time, like down to the minute. They have so unnaturally created a way to make you ovulate on a dime, on a chime. And you go in the next morning to get those eggs out. And they're playing smooth operator, nice. And they put you in a gown and give you anesthesia. And they take out eight eggs and your husband is spermed in a cup. So natural, so natural. And they mix it up and you go home and wait five days to see who makes it. And in the meantime, you prepare your body for the transfer when they put one or two or three, careful beyond that, come on, embryos in you. You trick your body to believe it's already pregnant. So you take prenatal vitamins, vitamin D, you take progesterone suppositories, won't go into it, three times a day. And you take your low dose aspirin and you wait and you hope. They call you on day three and six eggs fertilized and look good. They called you on day five and those six all made it to embryos. So you're going to get them chromosome tested because you're old, you're old, your eggs are likely to have problems. And on the seventh day, you go in for the transfer. You don't eat the night before the morning of, you take the next two days off for bed rest. You will find out the results when you arrive, the results of the chromosome testing. You and your husband take the elevator up and haven't decided one or two, one or two twins baby you'll ask the doctor you think too and you hear cat fucking stevens in the lobby they are so good and they put you in a gown and you wait and you think wait they forgot to do the consultation with the doctor and your husband is still in the other room and are you just gonna say two here we go everybody and the nurse comes in and says wait sorry please change back you do have to do the consultation and you laugh and you pull the rubber cap off and you put your dress back on but you keep the medical sock booties because they feel satisfying for some reason better than other socks and the doctor walks you into a new room you haven't seen before that is also beige and gray and white and marble with an art book that is surreal with Salvador Dali's face looking at you and you look up and feel weird because the doctor has his shopping bags in this room too it's just another day for him and while you process that he swiftly hands you a paper with numbers on it and says I'm sorry to tell you that all the embryos have chromosome problems I'm sorry for the confusion there won't be a transfer today You look to the right and see a six-inch statue of a naked woman's torso with no head, arms, or legs. And everything gets weird. You realize this must be the room for women who are missing parts. This is the room where the women who are lacking things hear bad news. Where is this statue's head, voice, fingers? There's just the reproductive parts. Oh, but this is what I'm missing. You think, I I have fingers and hands voice and the doctor stands up so soon you can tell he hates this part of his job and you're so good at anticipating other people's needs that you want to make it easy and get out so you stand up too even though you feel like sitting in this place for 20 hours until you feel beige too you try to say thank you but a real real howler of a sob comes out it's bad 
and you try to go to the bathroom to hide it, but eventually you have to go through that fancy fucking lobby. James Taylor, God damn it, past all the other sad hopefuls to get to the elevator, to get out. They need a back door, you think. I want a fire escape, a failure escape. And you just hurry the fuck out of there and get in your car with your husband who takes you home, who gets you coffee, who takes you to sushi, and gets bacon, wine, all the stuff you couldn't have. And you say hello to the new idea that you will never, ever have a baby with the man you love for the rest of your life that every period you ever had was for nothing, that you're getting great pubic hairs and everything's starting to go away and there's no diet that can help you, no mint tea, meditation that can make time go backwards. You missed this. Like someone who never got to go to the top of the Twin Towers. It's done forever and it's all different now. You eat the garbage food. You go with your husband to look at a new apartment you might move to. You don't know. You don't care where you live, but either way... You married this person who can make you laugh, even on this miserable day. Even though you can't make a little hymn for him, you can't continue his line, pass on his traits, his beautiful blue eyes. And even though outside he's the cynic, he's the one blowing the wind in your sails, saying you already are a family. And a year later, he encourages you to go to the adoption thing with the other saddies. And there you meet a couple who did adopt a baby with this place, and the mom is a roller derby person, and nobody says, what a creative profession. Instead, they say that if you want to adopt, it will happen. You will have a baby in your life in six months or 12 months or 18, but it will happen. And there are no chandeliers or music, but you don't need it because just the truth makes you feel hopeful without any marble or anything. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I almost cried at the end. I forgot that part about Brian. I met, immediately was like, if you want to get married to someone else and have babies, you should do that. And he was like, what are you talking about? But he said really, that to him? Yeah, I was like, you should, like, I am I failed. Like, hmm. like if, you, if this is something that's really important to you, get rid of me. <laughs> he was like, okay, no. <laughs> that's insane. That's how you felt. Yeah, it was so sad. Um, I like this entry so much because I just never knew what... I didn't really know what IVF all entailed. And I just wonder how many people know. Yeah, the the shots and the schedule and stuff like that is... It's... Yeah, it's an easy secret to keep because you can't see it. Mm-hmm. But it's I had so no idea sad. that you had to administer shots to yourself. Yeah, and they're weird. They have the, I mean, I don't I, I don't take other medications, so I'm not used to taking, but they have these very modern, like some of them you have to mix up. They come with these two little vials and there's powder in one and saline in the other, but you have to mix it right before you put it in and you can't spill a drop and you draw it out with one needle and you change the needle cap to another kind of needle top and then you pinch the skin and inject it, but you have to keep moving it every day. It's very elaborate and that's really intimidating because mm-hmm. they go through it with you once and they're like be very careful and then you drive home and you're like wait what was the second thing she said although there are videos but it's just like you're mm-hmm. alone and brian was like do you want me to help you and i was like i don't know what you would do stand here and uh, you know mm-hmm. so i would like put yeah. music on and try and be like cool i put this really beautiful brazilian music i love on and i was like okay i'm gonna make this and a friend of mine sent me these meditation this woman like imagine your body as a garden and like just beautiful like fruit fl- like flowers and things blooming and like and as mm. much as I have ever been cynical about that stuff I was like yes please like mm-hmm. I'm just gonna imagine my body is like full of growth and possibility and stuff mm-hmm. and then go out and audition or whatever the next day and mm-hmm. with these little scabs yeah so that's an, a a nine-day process then I think you do it for a week you go in when your period starts The first day of your period, they can see how many eggs you have, how many follicles are growing. Wow. And if it looks good, they'll be like, okay, so start the medication tonight. And I think you do it for seven to nine days. Okay. And then they do that egg extraction. And then you have to trick your body into thinking the the egg extraction is when you would be ovulating. Mm -hmm. So when you would get pregnant naturally. So they pull all those eggs out, but then you keep taking progesterone and estrogen or whatever it is, these different pills and, and suppositories. So your body is like, okay, we're rolling so that it, mm-hmm. when the embryos work, they just pop them in there and your body's already like on the, on track for pregnancy. Mm-hmm. But they don't tell you until you get there, which is insane that you show up that morning, like I'm going to get these embryos. And they're just like, no, bye. Like, I, I think that is What insane. do you mean? What, what? 
like they could call they that chromosome testing they do will tell you whether or not the embryos are viable and they have to wait five days to do it. And I guess they also wait five days because some of the embryos, if they're not going to make it, will, won't make it five days. So mm-hmm. they kind of put them in these Petri dishes or whatever and they grow, grow, grow. And by day five, they'll take a tiny bit out, which doesn't affect anything. All the cells are kind of mush, I think, at that point. It's not like hmm. this is part of the brain matter or whatever. So they'll take that out and do chromosome testing. Mm-hmm. But the last time we did IVF was after my dad died. It was the third time. And I said to the nurse, you have to let us know the day before. Like I had an ultrasound and it was not going well. There were not a lot of eggs developing, but they got, so they, we did an egg retrieval. They got one and it made it to day five. And mm-hmm. then they were going to do this chromosome testing. Oh, and then we'd had five or so reserved from October. So we had frozen ones and this one. And I was so shaky emotionally because my dad had died like a month ago or a month and a half ago. Mm-hmm. And I, I just pleaded with her. I was like, if you can call us that morning, please just call us and let us know. Because driving to, we we were a drive away from where we live. And I was like getting showered and dressed and ready and mentally taking that journey. And then finding out no there is so devastating. And she did call us, thank God. Like mm-hmm. she was like, I just want to let you know. And I was like, okay, hope you're having a nice day. I want to thank you so much for calling. And Brian was like, hang up the fucking phone. You don't have to take care of her. Because I was just like, and then I was like, oh, fuck. Like it was just mm-hmm. devastating, but at least I could have that meltdown at home instead of there's something really awful about having that sort of a meltdown in a fertility clinic because the couples in the lobby are like, excuse me, I just spent $30,000. Like, why is she sobbing? You know, you don't want to like disrupt it for anyone else or you just don't want to have that there. It's not private. Mm-hmm. It's too sad. It sucks that it's like that because it's such an emotional thing. It's like, how could it not? How could somebody not? have a a breakdown there yeah i'm sure there is a very high percentage of older ladies like me who go in there and don't have a successful time Mm -hmm. so they need to really figure out like how they can really leave through a back door or have a room where they can just be like hi just sit here for a half hour we're gonna bring you some donuts like i'm sure they have extra fucking ten dollars to take care of people that Mm -hmm. way instead of just like sorry it didn't work out bye go home like yeah like this isn't just a business Yeah. Like, what about bedside manner? Yeah. It just feels like very efficient bedside manner. Like, we said nice things, and this is pretty. Please, thank you. There's nothing else we can do for you. Like, oh. Mm. But so so you said, so they won't tell you on the phone usually. Like, you would Mm -hmm. have to go there and actually sit down with somebody, and then they would explain it to you in person. The nurse I spoke to said, we don't get the results until that morning. And I was like, that's okay. I don't care if you call me a half hour ahead. Like, right. I'm sure they're not getting the results from the lab the minute I walk in the door. Like, right. I'm sure there's a, an hour and a half hour. They can call it 7 a.m. if I get there. So, mm-hmm. right. And you guys went through three rounds of that. The second round in the middle, we just froze the embryos and didn't test them because the chromosome testing is really expensive. Hmm. So they said, if you just do two rounds together and take them all and chromos- you only pay for the one chromosome testing. Mm-hmm. So in October, before my dad got sick, the mm-hmm. first round happened around July. And then in October, I was like, like yoga every day, meditation, walks, like thought, good thought, like really healthy eating, no sugar, no caffeine, no bread. And I was like, I feel good. I felt happy. Um, so I really thought like, even though when March came, I was like, even though there's like one raggedy <laughs> embryo, I was like, those fall ones for sure. Mm-hmm. I really was like, I, I don't know if we should have twins or not. And I also had this feeling after my dad died that like the the magic thing that's going to happen out of this is like dad's ghost will reach out or like God or whatever, you know, like this will happen for us to, to bring life as we just lost life. And then be like, nope, it's another loss it was just like, fuck, mm-hmm. like, fuck that's mm-hmm. not how it's supposed to be mm-hmm. it can't just be all loss mm-hmm. so something that is is interesting to me is when i saw brian's one man show he talks about how you are so positive all the time he's like i married this person who opens up the shades in the morning it's like it's sunny outside and he's like we live in los angeles every day it's sunny outside <laughs> But what I like in what you've written here is that, well, you said, and even though outside he is the cynic, he is the one blowing the wind in your sails saying you already are a family. I really like that you wrote that because 
in that show, he, you know, depicts himself as the cynic too. And that you're like the super, super positive one. But in this, it's like on the outside, he is the cynic, but he's the one like putting the wind in the sails right now. Yeah, he is like a cynical optimist. And I think that, you know how you can like run a low grade fever? I think I run a a low grade uh, pessimist. So I'm like, yay, it's all great. And I think, I I even think it was Brian's, he first recognized that like, you're actually a pessimist and I'm actually an optimist. And I was like, yep, it's true. Like when we first moved in together, I had been married before and I was like, I just want you to know that therapy needs to be an option. This is really hard. Living with someone is hard and sharing. And he was just like, we get to live together. Like he had never had a relationship where he lived with someone like that. And he was so excited. And I was just Mm -hmm. like, oh, he had all of the optimistic energy. And I needed it so badly because I was like, I've been hurt before. And like, Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so he really carries me in those extreme times. Gene, I was wondering before you started writing this blog, Mm -hmm. how were you coping with sadness? I went to therapy once a week. I um, I played Yahtzee compulsively in a way that is really sad. And I, there's a little computer, like I have a little iPad game that I used to play too. And I know that Brian would come home and I would just be like, da, 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 da. like it's like a word find game, like bing, 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 bing. And he'd be like, but he's so greatly not like, you got to get up. He'd be like, hey, Hope you're doing all right. You know, Mm -hmm. where I would just spend hours and be like, oh, my neck hurts. Like, oh, I just sat here for two hours finding words Mm -hmm. or playing Yahtzee. Also jigsaw puzzles. Mm -hmm. Um, This summer after dad died, I started taking a walk from our place up to the, and then a hike up to the top of Griffith Park, the Dante's Peak. Mm -hmm. It'd be like two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. So I'd just get up at like 6 a.m. and walk and hike and listen to music or something and that helped but it was still kind of an isolated thing I felt like I overwhelmed my friends with like hey it's me I had another miscarriage and they'd be like okay I mean they weren't jerks but I felt like I how many times can you call someone and be like the wind blew my house down the wind blew my house down again the wind blew my house down again like you know what I mean I didn't have anything really good to bring to the table so I just isolated I I wonder if I'm not sure about this but do you think that there is this expectation that women should just get over a miscarriage quickly because like your body shed this so it's obvious it wasn't supposed to happen or something and and that there's not enough space created for people to really mourn that loss I don't know I don't know if there's an expectation for it to get done quickly, but I think nobody knows what the fuck to do. Like, I know some people are like, should there be a funeral or do you name, like, what, what is it? What happens? Like how, how nobody knows what to do. Um, I read this article, a friend of mine forwarded from the New York times that was, oh shit, I think it was in Japan where there's like a place where people plant a little tree or something every time they have a miscarriage. And it's like this growth come, like it marks the loss and is something like, there's no ritual. There's no rite of passage or something like this has happened. So I think everyone just feels confused. And I guess the response to that is then let's not talk about it anymore. Hmm. Your body's on one month cycle. You can have sex again in a month. So bounce back. Mm -hmm. So maybe in our culture, we just, we need to have some sort of mourning ritual for that, like planting something. Yeah. Planting anything. Yeah. Doesn't even need to be something actually in the ground. I used to buy plants just instinctively, just because I was like, I need to do something positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just just going off of, again, just what you were just talking about when I I just asked you, you know, what do you do to cope with sadness? Griffith Park is, like, I feel like that's been a healing place for me. That feels like a place of bouncing back, that place. Once I was there in the morning and I saw a buck, like a eight pointer or whatever, with with the headgear all, like cut in front of me and running down the mountain so quickly and I was so like thank god I was like wow magic yeah not a coyote beautiful nature it's so beautiful there I just love it Mm -hmm. that's exhilarating you saw a buck yeah and it was running yeah running downhill too I was like be careful (laughs) your footing (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's a lot of loose gravel because of the dryness (laughs) but I think what you said also makes you think the desert there's something about the desert that is the sunlight 
cleans, you know, like the, some, like the same way salt water cleans wounds. Like there, I feel mm. like there's something to sunlight that, like that moisture almost holds bacteria and can hold unhealthy things. And like darkness and rain can keep feeding mm. depression. And there's something about sunlight that like brings everything out into the light mm. or I don't know what it is, but mm. it's very helpful hmm. for me. Gosh, it's like purifying almost. Exactly. That's exactly what I was trying to say. You know what's really crazy about that place too? Because you know how like it's it'll get so dry here and, and everything's like evaporated. It doesn't even take that much water and all of a sudden everything turns green again. Yeah. I'm those like, who plants. are you plants? I know they're amazing. They could just hang in there for months and unbearable heat and then just be like, bing, as soon yeah. as it rains. I feel like that's right. maybe how we are here. And I don't know, I feel like the people in LA are like special hybrids. I think so too, because much of people's creative life is uh, holding out for biding your time or hanging in there until something breaks through or something happens. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I feel like this year, um, the word breakthrough, that's my word for the year. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's a great word. I, I feel like it's a word it's for exciting. a lot of people though. Like, I don't know. I feel like 2017 is a breakthrough year. It's shift. Everything is shifting. Yeah. Especially politically everywhere. Socially, mm-hmm. I think there's the sh- big shedding of the skin and, and a, a time of change. Mm-hmm. And something that was comforting to me that my therapist had said after the election where I was like, ah, I'm crying every day. I don't know what to do. And mm-hmm. she was like, well, this time, the time before change, it takes a while. It doesn't, people don't just react and organize and change. She's like, this is good time where people don't know how to feel and don't know what to do and feel a little lost and things will gel and set. It just takes time. And I was like, okay, hmm. thank you. I believe you. And sure enough, things get focused and action gets taken and mm-hmm. that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Jean, would you read for us Shoveling? Shoveling. It's late August, so my family is starting to have the holiday conversation with divorces on both sides, my husband's parents and mine. It's always been that rickety, we made plans to go here, you already have other plans, right? Discussion? Nobody wins when the parents are divorced. Every holiday leaves someone sighing in the hallway. Last year was easy to plan. My aunt got married Thanksgiving weekend in North Carolina, so that's where we went. It was a typical wedding for two widowed people in their 70s, early ceremony, guests with facelifts and tattooed makeup, and that weird drinky couple who brags about swinging with other retirees. We've all been there. My dad was with his girlfriend and her family in New Jersey, so he should have been fine, except that the next day she called us and said he was acting really weird and thought he should go to the hospital. It didn't make sense. He was only 72 and always said, with his eyebrows up and his childlike smile, all my friends are on pills. I don't take any pills. There are lots of kinds of deaths. Sudden accident ones, slow gradual ones. And this one, which was like, whoops, wait a minute, what? Like someone throws you something and you try to catch it and it's slippery and you don't know what it is and you almost have it and you drop it and you realize right when it hits the floor that it was a fish, but it doesn't matter now, it's gone. In January, he got officially diagnosed with bile duct cancer, got hospice set up at home, then couldn't talk, then eat, then open his brown eyes, all in six days. He died at like 2.30 in the morning in his girlfriend's arms with my husband and me on couches nearby. And then a weird hospice nurse rolled in an hour later who seemed like she had COPD and had to keep sitting down before she could pronounce him dead. And then she absentmindedly pulled out his pick line, which is where the morphine went in, and realized she had pretty much poked a hole in a blood balloon. She squeezed and wrapped and finally duct taped it or something. We called the undertakers, who looked like 50s cartoons of undertakers. Like one was five feet tall with dyed black hair and a dyed black mustache who said, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am like an old school waiter, and the other guy was like seven feet tall, completely bald, and never spoke. They rolled his body away at 3.30 a.m. My husband flew to Utah for a job at 10, and then, just when we had made the majority of the terrible calls you have to make to friends and family after someone dies, it got quiet, and the sky began to release an unholy blizzard upon us. Tons of snow fell and pushed down all over the house and driveway, pushing, pushing for hours. I sat with my father's girlfriend eating chocolate-covered pomegranate seeds from some gift basket and tried to remember how to watch TV. 
I've lived in California for eight years now, so snow is thrilling to me. Thrilling. I was very excited to wake up Sunday and more than glad to start shoveling and to have some physical job to do that wasn't grim loads of hospitalish laundry. Shovel, lift, pitch. Shovel, lift, pitch. The snow is cleansing. No more community theater friends singing Amazing Grace. No more lemon mouth swaps, just snow. We made little paths. We made little patterns. We took turns attacking the new smooth snow and shouted in accents. It was deep as hell and bright, clean white. It was a grand old time for an hour. By the time we got down to the cars, it was a little less cute and fun. We stopped making jokes and started getting practical and efficient and then overwhelmed. And just when I really started to be aware of my left shoulder, down the driveway came a tall, loping, smiling guy about six feet who looked like he sprang from the woods of Oregon. He had a shovel and offered to help. Dad's girlfriend took him to the back porch so we would have another exit cleared and I dug, swearing now and sweating around the tires of the Audi parked near me. Ooh, Audi, ooh. Don't be fooled. My father drove this car to work at JCPenney's. My father, who had once been a very successful stockbroker, had lost all of his money in the last six years. And the giant driveway we were shoveling wasn't even his. It all belonged to Chase Manhattan. Bankruptcy, foreclosure. Any day the sheriff's department could show up and evict him or his girlfriend now and give them only 30 days to clear their entire lives out. I wasn't thinking about that at the time. I was thinking about how snow feels so light but is heavy. I was thinking about which of the two lasagnas, Basking Ridge or Bernersville, I would eat for lunch. How silly my California boots were in real weather. And then that guy came back out. I thought that was fast for help. And he didn't say, I'm so sorry about your dad. He didn't say, how are you? He said, what are you going to do? And he nodded his head toward the house. And I said, oh, the foreclosure? Yeah, I don't know. Have a garage sale or something? I don't, I don't know. And he said, yeah, let me know if you need help with that, which was nice. And then it affects our property value. Then he lightheartedly sauntered back up the driveway toward his own home. And I was fooled by his tone and thought he really had been helping. He even said the word help, (laughs) helping and curious. It, It just didn't occur to me that someone would 24 hours after a death come sniffing around to see if their property fucking value was intact. People are amazing. People are amazing. I went inside and up into my father's study where I was staying. I was so pissed that my father had kept so many things from so many people and just left it for everyone else to clean up. I thought of Brenda Blevin crying, secrets and lies, secrets and lies in that movie. I started to go through things that were none of my business. I went through his credit card bills to try and make sense. I saw letters, sketches, proof of lies about him leaving my mother 20 years ago. I suddenly felt a need to read every single thing in the room to know once and for all who my father completely was. Why had he lost jobs? Why a second mortgage? When did his affairs start? I knew it wasn't my business, but I kept going. Photographs he had taken on secret trips, unpaid taxes, and later that afternoon, I found his pornography. I remembered finding these exact same old Playboys and penthouses when I was a kid, reading them wide-eyed, cover to cover, all of it unveiling the secret adult world of semi-surprised women who kept forgetting their pants and panties all the time. I would have never dreamed, 11-year-old me, that someday I would see these very same images again as a grown-up. One of the lawyers I spoke to had said, get all the valuables out of the house and just walk away. That advice was repeated about filing the will and everything. Just walk away. Walk away. Well, I had found some valuables here and I was ready to take them home, cash in, and divide up the spoils with my sister and dad's lady. I packed them in the suitcase, feeling only just slightly gross, and when I got back to Los Angeles, looked them up, rubbed my hands together, and saw they were worth $4, $2, five dollars four dollars they were only valuables to him maybe he thought they were valuable like all of the worthless stamps he whispered about in his last days maybe they were just his favorites or he liked the james bond excerpt or maybe he just forgot to throw them out i'll never know i had to let go of physical dad a day ago and i was just beginning to let go of knowing him nobody ever knows anybody the fish slipped to the floor. Ew, never mind. Why fish? Nobody throws people fish. This Thanksgiving, we will cook here in California, where it will likely be sunny and 75 without the slightest hint of snow. 
That was really great. Thank you. Why did you choose the fish? I think uh, when I was trying to g- capture the feeling of how quickly we lost my dad, mm-hmm. it was slip. It was just like when you're trying to hold something that's slippery, and a fish, I think, is the most slippery thing you you want to try to grab. And the way it's not aerodynamically, but water dynamically mm-hmm. <laughs> shaped is just impossible to hold. So it's just like slippery. It was such a good metaphor. I thought. Thanks. I can't believe that neighbor that came up to you guys in this pristine moment. I love the way that you captured that moment, by the way, that you guys were like yelling in accents. Yeah. Just having a little bit of playfulness. There's something so clean about the snow after being inside and having this kind of living wake for a week and then just being like fresh, Mm -hmm. quiet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then that guy, just the neighbor. Yeah. He just said that to you guys. Like he presented himself that way with no, no qualms. Yeah. And there was also another element. I, ta- I wrote about the hoarding later. I didn't want to write about it just then because it's so sensitive and I didn't want to be disrespectful, but there was a lot of hoarding in the house and that's the reason they couldn't sell it when, when it was um, in foreclosure. Mm-hmm. They couldn't stage it like how you stage a house for people to come in. So it's a huge house. But it was just wrecked. It was just full of stuff. And they couldn't sell it. So that's what he was really saying. Like, what are you going to do about mm. getting all that stuff out of there? But I didn't want to add that on there, too. Because mm-hmm. it was... I wanted to think about that a lot before I wrote about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it doesn't need it. It's already awful. Oh, my god! And I know he wanted to walk through the house to see what it looked like. It was like a private drive and like four houses on it. I'm sure they all talked and were just like... You know, like, I'm sure he was the one who's like, let me go in there and find out what's going on. Mm -hmm. But fuck you, dude. I mean, to put it under the guise of, like, wait a week Mm -hmm. and to not help, like, to bullshit help. Like, he was a big, strong man. And we were two women, like, who were (laughs) so tired and full of grief. Like, it it was not even 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So that is just galling. That is Mm -hmm. just really crazy to me. Mm Mm-hmm. Did you figure it out right away what was happening or were you, was it only after the fact that you were thinking about the exchange? It took me a while as he was walking away. I was like, that was fast. Like he was so, his demeanor, even when he was like, what are you going to do about the house and stuff? And like, that's why I was like, oh, maybe have a garage sale, I guess. Or like, I don't know how we'll get rid of all of that stuff. And I think I do have a denial mechanism in me when when something is going bad to be like, it can't be that bad. This is actually okay. So I just was like, I believe his tone of voice and he's going to help with the garage sale someday. And then when he turned and walked away, I was just like, that was so fast. That was so fast. And then I was like, oh no, mm-hmm. that was like, uh, it, I just don't, it, it wouldn't occur to me that someone would be so awful like that. So mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't think about it. And then when I told Brian, I called Brian because he had to fly out that morning to go do a show. And he was just like, I fucking wish I was there. I would have fucking knocked that guy. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, I should be mad. Like, <laughs> I'm so tired. I don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just shame on that guy. I wish I fucking punched him. I wish I had the frame of mind to just be like, get the fuck off of here. You know, like, get out of here. Yeah, yeah. Even though we didn't own the land. <laughs> get off Chase Manhattan Banks. With Private property. Yeah. He's like... Yeah, we were so vulnerable. My, there's one wise, many wise things my dad used to say, but one of them is people judge by their own standards. So if someone's always like, that guy's a liar, that guy's a liar, that person's a liar, they, they're probably a liar because they assume the whole world works that way. So I don't, I assume people operate the way I do, which is you're going to come over and help. You're going to come over. You say what you're doing. You know, you do what you say. Yeah, you're honest. And yeah. And that if somebody is in one of the most horrible times in their life like losing a family member is 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 one of the hardest things you could handle like i can only imagine people would only do something kind and helpful Mm -hmm. it's still crazy to me yeah did you ever see that person ever again no the funeral was like a week later we couldn't plan the funeral because the the blizzard was really bad the city Mm -hmm. was or the town was shut down my sister couldn't get up from maryland so it kind of forced everyone to stay put. Mm-hmm. And then the funeral was a week later. And I woke up the morning of the funeral and packed my stuff and like went to the funeral. And from there went to Brian's mom's in Philadelphia and then flew back home. Because mm-hmm. I had already been there maybe over two weeks. Mm-hmm. And then I haven't been back. Mm-hmm. And I knew when I was leaving, mm-hmm. I was like, I won't be back to this house. Because I knew there was nothing there for me. Was it? Is it sold now? Was I don't it a- know. Oh, well, okay. actually, I got... 
the weekend of that anniversary came up in January and I was, as I was preparing to be like, this is going to be a hard time. I got served papers from the mortgage company as did my sister. And I assume other people, um, like this is progressing. We're filing suit against anyone who might have interest. And I was just like, why am I fucking getting sued? And like got sad and mad, but it's a collection agency thing. And they're, I'm not responsible for his debt in any way, but it was just another like last fuck you. So I imagine that the foreclosure is progressing Mm -hmm. and that there will be an eviction, but I haven't been in touch with my dad's girlfriend Mm -hmm. in a while. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was going to say it's interesting though about that neighbor because he was the catalyst for making you go inside and be like, who is my dad? Yeah, I guess that anger, it, it like awoke an anger in me. Like I was so tired and sad and tired and sad and tired mm-hmm. and sad. So then I was just like, fuck. Mm-hmm. In that room where I was staying was, it was like a guest room with an adjoining like office area with all of his papers. And he liked to do artistic stuff too. So there were paints and sketches and all of his stuff. And then I was like, I have to get to the bottom of all of this, right? It was my only private space. If I was in the house, I was interacting with his girlfriend a lot. We got together, got along very, very well. We're not that close, but it wasn't. We were very supportive of one another. It was such a really hard time, but I also just needed time for myself. Mm -hmm. So whenever I would go out there and close the door, then I was like, what happened? Mm -hmm. But there is, it's a weird thing when someone dies. Also, like I saw notes I had written to him and I was like, oh God, like you, you, if people keep stuff you sent them, it's a weird, it's almost like an evaluate, not an evaluation, but um, uh, an, an inventory of yourself as well. Like, mm. wow, I was in my 20s, like sending postcards, like, what's up, ding dong, nah, nah, nah. like, I don't know what, what my participation in our relationship was too. It made me really think about like, was I a good daughter? Mm-hmm. You know, it's weird. Yeah. It's really thorough. And then I was like, get me the fuck out of here. Because mm-hmm. there were pictures of my family and a picture of my mom and, and our dog and my mom was folded back like, oh, or mm-hmm. like just old angry stuff. Mm-hmm. Or I found um, his dayminder planner thing from the year he got divorced. And I just started to go through that to try and find out like, was he taking trips with his girlfriend? What was going on? And it was like the court date was surrounded with a circle and like single exclamation point. And I was like, oh my God, that was the saddest day in my mom's life. And he was so happy. And I was like, ooh, it just hurt. It just mm-hmm. hurt to go through that stuff. Mm-hmm. And your dad, I mean, he also, um, he like changed his life, right? Like he, you said he was a stockbroker, but then he, then he went into theater. Somehow. Yeah. When we were growing up, he worked in New York and he was like a banker and stuff. And then he lost his job at one point and was unemployed for a bit and then became a stockbroker. And then about two, three years later, I went to college and then he started doing community theater. And when he started doing community theater, he met this woman and fell madly in love with her hmm. she was definitely the love of his life and then all of a sudden he was this other person and wow. he left my mom got this big splashy house because we grew up in a very f- f- fine house but not like this kind of situation and also just I, there was one with like the statues of naked women and like lavish stuff everywhere i was like who is this because mm-hmm. my dad was like a pilgrim i didn't know mm-hmm. this side but he always like drew for you when you were little, right? Cause yeah, he did caricatures of us and our friends. And he was very creative. He used to make up stories and tell us stories and stuff. And he was a really wonderful and loving father and mm-hmm. very, very supportive. Always saying you could do whatever you want to do. Like he was, so he wasn't a bad person. You know, like I have a lot of painful memories of what happened when our family was destroyed in that way. But I can definitely see how much of a wonderful parent he was and very loving very Mm -hmm. very very compassionate and loving person Hmm. gene i'm wondering would you take us out with muscling of course i would be happy to muscling somewhere in the last two months my body decided no more crying maybe it was just the holidays were coming the anniversary of dad dying was on the heels of those or just the general weariness of the behavior with a u hi canadians I thought I was just maybe softening until last night when my husband and his mother and I watched Manchester by the Sea. I will spoil nothing by telling you that any being with a heart, yes, maybe your dog too, you weirdos, will cry when they see this movie. There are truly sad moments that are beautifully acted and directed. But somehow, I just kept checking my phone. 
Actually, I also kept flexing my toes in time with music that wasn't playing. <laughs> bing, 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 bing. I felt my head surging toward tears like the water was pushing up my neck and the side of my skull to burst out the little tiny cry holes in the front, but I wouldn't. About a month ago, my husband and I were in the thick of adoption preparation. Friends, this is nothing like the having a baby preparation montages you see on TV, in movies, or on Glidden ads. We weren't painting a room in, into a minty light green with my swelling belly and a pair of ballooned overalls or screwing together plush mobile parts. I was getting fingerprinted in a UPS store and where I learned that UPS also ships cars. Anyway, I was standing in front of this little green machine with a middle-aged store manager who kept saying, it's not rating, when I pressed my fingers on the screen. I didn't particularly like this guy. Nothing too wrong. I just didn't want to have to include him in my life in any way. This wasn't a cute story about getting fingerprinted where my husband and I got in an ink fight, swiping our faces and making little football eye marks. This was a chore alone at a chain store on a Tuesday after Thanksgiving with a stranger who looked like a medieval times regular, Warren. Warren asked if my hands were maybe too dry, and I fake laughed and said probably, and flipped my palms up for us both to look at. Every part of adopting a baby involves scrutiny, from the home inspection, to the six hours of interviews about your life and marriage and family, to the making sure your car brakes work. When I held my hands out to the sky and saw that they were... Yes, totally dry. I almost cried there. Yes, another minor fuck up. Look at my dry, dry, unmoisturized hands, stranger. Want to see my toes too? I dropped something on my right big one last June and the bruise is still growing out. Is that your business too now, Warren? Warren said they had lotion. It wasn't lotion exactly though. It was something far weirder called corn huskers with no apostrophe. It's not even white like lotion. It's more the color of hydrogenated oil. Ugh, mm, so natural. And as Warren first distributed the corn huskers into his own dry hands and then wiped it onto mine, gross, don't touch me. And was I not to be trusted with the corn huskers? Did some customers of the past like hoard or contaminate the huskers? Was I 12 fucking years old? And my almost tears twisted into angry resignation, muscling. Fine, Warren. I have all day to roll my index finger back and forth because you forgot to enter the right digit number. Thanks, Warren. Yes, Warren. I don't care about anything, Warren. A few days later, I stopped by the bank to get a copy of every account statement I have and credit card history because that's also a part of the scrutiny. Our social worker had said, go to your local branch and find one of the bankers you know. It's easier that way. And I thought, <laughs> I couldn't describe a single employee in my bank. I use the ATM. I deposit checks and withdraw from there, and that's about it. Maybe if I had a more rich and full banking life, I would have a personal banker, and I would have thought, oh, Michelle, and gone in there and give Michelle a hug and gotten this statement from awesome Michelle, who lit up every time I blew in to fill out a slip. But the last time I was in my bank, its ATM had sucked in a check wrong and deposited it twice and then sent my employer an insufficient payment notation for the second deposit attempt and charged me 25 bucks, so we weren't even exactly on hugging terms, even if I knew anyone named Michelle. I got there and was asked to wait until the manager could see me. Her name was Nadezhda. She had blonde hair pulled back and lots of lipstick. <laughs> she walked me back to her cubicle the way a person walks who only walks small distances back and forth each day. A sort of swaggery bullshit manager walk. Not sustainable. I said what the social worker recommended. Hi, my husband and I are in the adoption process and I need to get a financial statement, please. And she tilted her head, hair to the side and said, Oh, that's nice. Which is exactly where she could have just printed the fucking thing out and given it to me and said goodbye. But somehow, my hands were too dry here too. But it wasn't my hands, it was something else. And instead of corn huskers, I had to have this woman's thoughts on the matter wiped onto me. So many women from this neighborhood are doing adopting. And I already thought, not interested, Nadej, can I call you Natty? But I said, oh, wow which is my pat neutral conversation answer that might seem like I'm interested, but more often is me saying to myself, oh, wow, I couldn't possibly give a shit. She continued, I have a daughter who's two. I don't care. It is the best uh, thing to have child. Uh-oh. Many peoples in the U.S. have struggles making a baby. Oh, fuck, why? I was lucky. I had OBGYN who is a miracle worker. She can help people make baby who can't, who have the fertility problem. I hate you. I hate this bank. But I didn't even need her. I got pregnant and was okay, was healthy. Please don't tell me your age. And I'm 33, so I was worried it wouldn't work. There I stopped wowing and just left a pause. 
Maybe it would somehow occur to her that she was saying things that one might not say to someone who has the struggles. I wanted to say five miscarriages or three IVFs, but I could tell that this was the kind of person who would never be self-aware, which made me want to shout, you're a fucker and you're hurting me with this. But she held the keys to the kingdom. This was my one and only bank. Why did I never do the credit union? Why do I never do things? Why didn't I protest in November or something and just send that one small donation? Why am I frozen? I never take action. What is wrong with me? Will I ever work again? So I had to listen to and look at Nadezha. She continued, often it is the man's, often it is the sperm's. Uh, and yes, because natty dreadlocks. Yes, because the pollution, the pesticides, and the processed ding-dongs, the Doritos. Yes, yes, your homeland is better with your fresh milk and your green grass. But why then are you in Los Feliz mad? You have to take the cheese whiz with the freedom. I think this is the food in the U.S. I think is the diet. Go away. Go all the way away. Away. And leave my paper and go be a natural mother. You win. And yes, I really hate myself. Ha ha ha. So you really win so much. Somewhere in the middle of her treaties on American fertility, I stopped wowing and started to hold still and only blink. I didn't cry. I pulled myself into a small, pea-sized version of myself, withdrawing deeper and deeper into the center of my brain and let the rest of my empty body continue this interaction. This would last for a time, then this would end this situation and I would be one step further toward having a family. It's not the scrutiny actually. I don't mind explaining myself. If I were giving up my precious baby for adoption, you can be sure I would want the parents to be tested in every way possible, far more intensely than we will be. It's the conversation over and over it's that every step involves talking to strangers and that every stranger has two cents about it and gets to know that i can't have kids for whatever reason it's every person slowly circling around and asking in a variety of attempting to be sensitive ways how do you guys feel about race i don't know everyone how is your bank account how do you feel about the gender of the child you bore and how do you feel about the race you are How do you feel about the mental illness in your family or the drinking your own mother did before or after she had you? Why do you get to ask me how I feel about every facet of a new life and why do I have to consider it? I don't care. I want to fast forward to having the baby. I don't want to answer a thousand questions in the first year about, but isn't breast milk so much better? Or how hard was it for the birth mother? Or to hear the phrase real mother and know that so many women have had successful pregnancies and to them I'm just a substitute and I will never know the bond, the real bond. This all swims in my head as we travel for Christmas. And I think back on the book I bought for my father last year, right before he had the strokes. I didn't know he would never read again and that he would just die in a month. I didn't think the title Dead Wake would have two words that would echo in such a horrific way throughout the year. I didn't know I would never buy him a present again, that I wouldn't go back to New Jersey like we always have when we came to Pennsylvania for the holidays. And so when we sat down to watch Manchester by the Sea last night, I muscled through it. I tilted my own head hair and thought from my pea-sized version of me, wow, that's sad. But I didn't feel it. That's okay. I like this holiday. I don't want to drench it with losses. So P me will listen to the songs and eat the foods and be extra grateful that my mother gives us hand lotion in our stockings every year. Warren. Happy holidays. As happy as you can. Thank you, Jean. You're welcome. I forgot it did go cover adoption at Christmas all at once. Yeah, it's wild. You like run the gamut here you cover a few different things it's like you took us on a wild ride Mm -hmm. oh I so love this when you say this was my one and only bank why did I never do the credit union why do I never do things (laughs) isn't this how quickly we spiral yeah just a pile up of like I can't do anything right just because yeah I don't like this one bank manager. <laughs> and then at the same time, I'm just, I, as someone reading this, I'm so sad that this woman is doing this too. And she has no, she's so oblivious to social cues. Yeah. She was in no way grace. mean, not a mean person at all, but just like it never had occurred to her what someone's experience was like if they were adopting. It's not like people, I mean, maybe some people just seek, always want to adopt children, but more often than not, they try and then they adopt. It's not like, oh, they have to adopt. But like, there's also pain. Yeah, it just never occurred to her, I think. Mm-hmm. And I 
I know that I could use a lot of personal growth in the department of being like, Hey, I don't want to talk about that. I just need to get this done if that's okay. But part of me is passive and just like, Oh my God, this is happening to me instead of I have control over this conversation too. Mm -hmm. And then another part of me is like, how inappropriate will this go? Like, Mm -hmm. okay, I'm just going to sit here and say, wow. And just see how like wildly inappropriate you will go. Mm -hmm. Well, and you said you pulled yourself into a pea size you. So she was just talking and you're not even responding to her. You're just yeah. sitting there quiet. I mean, for me, when someone's like that, I just think, oh, they're shutting down. You know, yeah. she is not even realizing. No questions, this is- no engage, no back and forth. Yeah, she had no get read on how I was experiencing that. It's and like- it's just like so weird if you were like, oh, my God, I have I have like one I have kidney failure to be like, oh, my kidneys are great. You know what's funny is how great my kidneys are, and I should have bad kidneys. Like, that's not how we do it, <laughs> right? Right. You don't t- talk about how great your situation is when someone's. Yeah, it's a good place to ask questions. We, I, I know we don't ask each other enough questions. I have often talked about this that it's. I've noticed that, like, I'll ask someone questions. It's not very often reciprocated, which is always bizarre to me. But I understand. Um, Maybe it's also bizarre for them that someone's asking them questions and giving them the opportunity to talk. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Maybe they're like, hey, I'm free. Guess what? Someone's interested. Yeah. Yeah. Like, should I really keep talking? Should I? Okay, this person's listening. Okay, I'll just talk. I know. I mean, then there are people who are just talkers. Um, This was something I was thinking about yesterday. Um, Have you heard that pain and humor are intertwined with each other yes definitely I feel like there must be something scientific about it but and I'm not really exactly sure how to ask this question but isn't it so amazing that people who can feel the depth of pain or sorrow can also at the same time understand humor does it seem opposite no I think they're definitely connected because I think humor making someone laugh is such a specific I almost said exquisite, like it's such a beautiful release. And I think that it is uh, like symphonic. It involves a lot of specifics to the moment. And I mean, some things are just broadly funny for everything, but like having a sense of humor has to include the darkness and the light. So somebody who you almost have to have experienced pain and have be em- uh, empathic in that way or compassionate or understanding of that to turn that into something great and by being disadvantaged in some way or having had some struggle ha- helps you develop a sense of humor mm. like there if, if everything goes your way you don't have to mm. I mean Donald Trump doesn't have a sense of humor and not that he's never suffered or never had anything go his way but nope I'm not making any point about him I hate him I don't know why I brought that up <laughs> but I think it's more the um the love the people who had things go easily or have been valued like just like you don't have to struggle. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's absolutely connected. And so many stand-ups and comedy people have had very traumatic lives or struggle out with depression. So I think it is, it's a release too. It's like not a sexual release, but it is a way to release the weight of mm-hmm. painful things happening to you. Is to laugh. It mm-hmm. is just a relief. And it is why like that classic Mary Tyler Moore laughing at the funeral episode or like, it, the best laughs are are when undertakers are weird or a dead body is just like, oh, all this blood's coming out. Like, this is so sad. Like, oh, this is ridiculous and absurd. And now it looks like a Monty Python sketch. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not that life is absurd. Mm-hmm. I was talking with my sister about it this morning. My sister is so funny. And I know people say, oh, well, you know, like if like humor is a defense mechanism. Mm-hmm. My sister was saying it's not a bad thing because it, it's like rising to the surface. It's like heavy things happening and then taking that and then rising to the surface and finding joy, finding some piece of joy in it. I thought that was really interesting, like the positive side of a, of a defense mechanism. Yeah, it protects you. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that's right on. But I think it's weird. You know, they talk about frequencies and like how emotions have frequencies, like jealousy, Envy. Mm-hmm. These are like low grade frequencies. Oh. They or they 
there's like vibrations to the emotions and joy is a, a high frequency like joy and love and, and peacefulness. And so I think it's interesting because if you like let like low frequencies kind of chill in your body, then you're going into depression. Mm-hmm. But if you break that up, if you say like, this is so fucking sad, mm-hmm. you break that up with some joyful frequencies, then I think that's like the ultimate balance of existing in some way. Because you can't just always operate in a high frequency place. Yeah. There's got to be like the pendulum swinging in both directions. There's got to yeah. be that balance, definitely. You have to feel all, all of those feelings have to run through you. You won't be healthy if you don't let those feelings wash over you. Like feel all the pain of something and also break it up with, with joy. Which is a lot of times when little when little kids are learning to be funny or if they need attention or what, for whatever reason they're like being silly or getting what they need for that survival or whatever, they want to break tension in the room like there's too much anger in this house there's too much sadness in this house there's too much and I feel like kids can sometimes feel that that adults will be like no this is a sad day and this is gonna be sad all day and that not even a kid trying to be funny but just a kid in a natural element will be like I'm tired of being sad can we do this like I need to dance around now like no 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 this is a sad day like it's not natural to be in one in in stasis that way like for an entire day or for entire like it's just not natural right brian does this thing that really kills me when we were dating he first started doing it where if there is a super weird person somewhere he'll just tap me and be like that's you so for like in the car and some late like some lady is just like out of her mind dressed like super bananas like i'm walking down the street he'll be like look there you are that's you or just and then it just evolved into like him tapping me so every time we see a movie there is some person who's like, wait for me in the tree. And I know I'm just going to get tapped. So then, you know, I lean away from him to make it harder for him to be like, that's you, that's you. <laughs> and there was one time we were having, I was having a miscarriage and we had to go to the hospital two times. Or You have to have an ultrasound when you're having a miscarriage, which sucks. Mm. You already know it's bad or you, you've had a lot of blood loss. And then they're like, let's have an ultrasound, which is usually like, is there a heartbeat? Like, it's usually a happy thing. Mm-hmm. So then you go in there. And we had to wait and you're just bleeding. It's just horrible. It's just horrible. And it was like 1130 at night and we had to go through an ER and we were waiting in this hospital and this really old woman came out on a bed who had like no teeth and was like, Mm. like trying to chew and make sound with her tongue. And I was like, oh, that poor lady, that poor lady. And then it just got weird. And I was just like really caught like, can she speak? Can she do? And then I just felt tap, tap. And I was just like, oh, like I really have never laughed. And I was not in any way laughing at her, but just like, I, like, that's you. That's you. Like, just so, which is why I'm like, thank, thank God. There's no other way I could have gotten through with this. If I was married to somebody who took everything really seriously, like, we're going to have to work our way through this. Like, I would feel really strange. Like, I guess I'm going to be sad all the time. But Brian is constantly like, lightening up the darkness so it's yeah so yeah. Really lucky <laughs> <laughs> i hope i didn't give away too much with the tapping this no. tapping game <laughs> that's really funny jean thank you so 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 much you're welcome thank you for having me and thanks for reading all these and taking the interest in it i'm really glad you like it To read Jean's blog, or more like graze, chew, ponder heartily in holy digest, honest, and good writing, go to jeanvillepeak.wordpress.com. That's J-E-A-N-V-I-L-L-E-P-I-Q-U-E dot wordpress.com. Or click on the link in the show's description, which is located wherever you're currently listening to this podcast. You can also follow Jean on Instagram or Twitter at Villa Peak. If you live in Los Angeles or you frequent Los Angeles and you want to see Jean in a live improv show, you can see her right now at the Upright Citizens Brigade, Friday nights at 9.30 p.m. in a show called Soundtrack. And in the fall, you can see her at Improv Olympic West, Thursday nights in a show called Quartet. You can also experience Jean's improv performance via podcast on hit comedic show, Spontaneation. And lastly, AP Bio, the show Jean is currently starring in, is filming right now and is slated to air in January of 2018. 
playing underneath this is a track called Drawing the Blinds by Home. You can find more music by Home at bandcamp.com. This episode of Mostly Minutia was recorded on location in my kitchen in Glendale, California.